Hi, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, the founder of Clean Machine, a plant-based fitness nutrition company. My life's passion is to go out and find through science and nature the most nutrient-rich plants and make them available to people for optimal health and fitness. But some people living in this world can't even afford basic nutrition. And that's why it's such an honor uh, to introduce my guest who is doing just that. We have uh, the opportunity and um, to partner with, and we're kicking off this month uh, in supporting a wonderful nonprofit uh, that is providing life-saving nutrition to children in need. It's an honor to uh, to talk with you again, Paul. Uh, Paul Rodney Turner is the co-founder and international director of Food for Life. Welcome to. You. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> So, I mean, there's so much I want to unpack in this conversation, um, but let's go ahead and get started with the beginnings. You know, um, what led you to becoming vegan and what led you on a spiritual path, being a, a monk for a while, and, and how that evolved into your nonprofit work in the formation of Food for Life? Well, you know, if you look back at my life as a kid, I you certainly wouldn't project where I am now <laughs> from back then. I grew up in a in a pretty poor neighborhood of the western suburbs of Sydney. And um, so, you know, medi mediocre family, you know, income, and uh, we just were regular kids playing football and mm -hmm. black and white TV and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> but uh, at the age of 15, I was, I was always philosophical. So at the age of 15, I became interested in amateur astronomy. And I would sit up all night and look at the stars. And that sort of planted a seed of inquisitiveness. And I was wondering, you know, what? how did this all happen? What's what's uh, going on here? Because this is, creation is such an amazing thing. And we're so small and the universe is so big. So fast forward a few years, I was introduced to um, Eastern philosophy. I received a book called Life Comes From Life, written by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. And um, that book led me on a path of sort of asking questions about life itself. Uh, I learned about reincarnation. I learned about karma and those sort of things. And then a few years later, I decided to become a monk, which was a very radical thing back then, um, considering my background. Your back what year was this, just to add context? Yeah, so... I was born in 1963, so we're talking in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And um, so I actually joined the ashram at the age of 19. And wow. it was 1983. I was just, just 19, going on 20. We're very radical, shaved my head, uh, mm -hmm. lived a very regulated lifestyle, sleeping on the floor. I never slept on a bed for the next 14 years. I never had a pillow. Wow. I would wow. I would take bar I would take a, sh a cool shower every day regulated eating breakfast lunch and dinner was like regulated time we were you know we were busy in, either busy in the field because the ashram that I joined was in the it was in the countryside of Sydney and um, so we were growing our own food and that's it was a very ideal ideal lifestyle and is that where is that where you were introduced to pl a plant based diet. Yeah, I, was, I became a vegetarian. When I first read that book, Life Comes From Life, Swami Prabhupada basically makes the point that life is not simply just a combination of chemicals. It was very, mm -hmm. um, very life-changing because I realized, well, there's more to our existence, more to who I am than just a physical form. You know, there's something subtle about me. So, you know, then all of those things sort of, came together and made me realize that, okay, I, I need to find out what's going on here. And I just dived deep into becoming a monk, and uh, which was very radical. So from 19 to 33, I was a celibate monk. <laughs> um, and I was a vegetarian during that time. So a few years in, I think I became a vegan when I stopped being a monk. So as, as a monk, you're dependent on the temple. You're living in the temple. Mm -hmm. You're not eating outside. You're eating whatever the temple is providing. And of course, in the Krishna movement, 
a typical diet is like a lacto-based vegetarian diet. Mm -hmm. But I, I was also at that time looking after cows. So I had a nice relationship with cows. And it was only a few years later after I became married and I, I started attending uh, international vegetarian conferences and animal rights conferences that I was exposed to the abuse of cows and in animal agriculture. And I realized I can't justify this. So even then I was actually a monk. I was not a monk, but I was a priest in the temple. So I was a married man, but I was a priest. And I started preparing vegan meals for Krishna in the temple, mm -hmm. which was very radical. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was, I was uh, in, in some places I was demonized, you know, how dare you do this? But I stood strong and I realized that no, we, I cannot justify this. Um, so I've been a vegan for the last 22 years. And, and how, did that, how did that, um, I'm, I'm guessing after you left the ashram, how did you get involved into forming uh, or getting involved in, in charitable work? Did you do charitable work prior to that? I mean, with, with the, uh, obviously with the movement that you were in, there's a, a degree of charity, yeah. charity work too. Right? So actually my first service, and this is an interesting part of my evolution, is that my first, literally my first service as a monk was serving homeless people in Sydney. Hmm. So <laughs> um, I was, you know, part of the kitchen crew. We would prepare meals, and then we would take those meals from the farm, from the ashram or in, in the countryside, into Sydney, and serve the homeless, or you know, serve hungry people. So that was my first service, and I, be, you know, I continued doing that service, although I was doing many other things in the temple. But then in 19, around um, 1985, 86, it became like my full-time service. And uh, a few years later, I, in 1993, I left Australia. And I was asked by my mentor at that time to help set up the headquarters for Food for Life. Because when I first was in, uh, introduced to Food for Life, it was a very grassroots operation. There were literally only about, about a half a dozen projects around the world. It was very sort of disorganized, very grassrootsy. Um, so I was asked by my mentor, hey, help, let's let's set up a headquarters, let's create a system, let's build this thing. So in 1993, I left Australia. Uh, I began traveling around the world. I wrote a training manual for Food for Life. I began introducing Food for Life all across Europe. And then in 1995, we officially established the headquarters for Food for Life called Food for Life Global. And that's what I've been managing ever since. So a couple of decades now into yeah. it. Um, <laughs> so talk about the the evolution of, of growing a nonprofit, because obviously you've got fundraising going on, and then you've got the the work of actually distributing the food. So a lot of organization, a lot of uh, different uh, prongs to uh, running a nonprofit. Um, how did that evolve for you? And, and did you when did you really start to bring other people in to expand and grow it? Well, I was, you know, and this is another interesting part of my background. Um, because I became a monk at the age of 19, I did not go to college, although I had intentions of going to college, mm. uh, but I became a monk. <laughs> so I literally learned everything on the job, even as a monk. I taught myself how to use a computer, how to do graphic design, mm -hmm. uh, public relations, marketing, copywriting, uh, eventually web development. I, I developed the first Food for Life website in 1995, which is really early in the internet days. Mm -hmm. the, the first Food for Life website was, was launched in 1995. Um, and so I was you know, pretty much self-taught all of these things. I learned as I went along. And I started bringing in professionals, people with experience, which obviously I learned from as well. Um, and that's important. One of the, I think one of the, the big takeaways that you'll learn from people like Steve Jobs mm -hmm. is that he'll say that you have to always employ people or bring people on your team that are smarter than you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you never want to bring, bring people on that are, that are less, less intelligent, that, are, that aren't as smart as you. You want, you want to bring people on that really have something to contribute. So look for smart people, people that with very specific skills, bring them, welcome them, welcome them into the team mm -hmm. and empower them. That's very, very important. Mm -hmm. And at Food for Life Global, we have that culture. 
where you know we it's a, we're very strong on equal opportunity and we have volunteers and and people on on staff from all over the world from all backgrounds so Food for Life blossomed. It started out as is a plant-based company or nonprofit, uh, really focused on feeding the hungry. But it's blossomed into so much more than that. You have an animal sanctuary that your wife works with. You do education and training. You there's so much more to what you're doing right now, right down to the elements of how to get both on a cultural and a practical side, people moving over to a more plant-based and compassionate lifestyle. Yeah, it's true. When when Food for Life was first conceived back in the 70s by the Swami, his initial idea was, hey, we make we we need to make sure that no one goes hungry because at the end of the day, we're all brothers and sisters. So his famous statement, which sort of inspired the Food for Life project, was was spoken in 1974 in India when he saw village children, poor children, fighting with dogs over scraps of food. Mm. And uh, he was so shocked by this, he says, look, we can't allow this to happen. Wherever there's a temple, no one within 10 miles of our temple should ever go hungry. Mm. So, he, you know, he, he established the foundation of it that we should make sure that everyone gets a meal. And that's part of the ancient Vedic or Indian culture of hospitality. And, it, and it's a spiritual hospitality mm. because essentially what what it's driven by is this idea that we're all spiritual beings essentially all connected all all part of a spiritual family but we're all expressing ourselves through different physical forms because of our karma because of where we're at in our evolution mm -hmm. but our essence is soul mm -hmm. so at food for life global we promote this idea of uniting the world through pure food because we believe that food is the most powerful communicator uh, mm -hmm. any type of food really but more so when the food is prepared with a loving intention mm -hmm. it's plant-based in other words it's, there's less violence involved it's very pure high vibration that type of food has powerful transformative you know abilities uh, and so we we use that and we believe strongly that that is the answer to you to bringing people together around a proverbial universal dinner table um the concept of food yoga was introduced about seven years ago when I wrote a book called Food Yoga. And in Food Yoga, essentially, this is what it looks like. Yeah, Food Yoga. Very nice. Um, in Food Yoga, I try to explain that subtle aspect of food. It's sort of like the philosophy of food for life. And that really makes us difference in the, different in this space because even though we're very good at what we do, we can feed more people for less money than any other organization in the world. We're the most cost-efficient food relief. Literally for 25 cents, we can provide a freshly cooked vegan meal, not prepackaged, not frozen, washed and clean, uh, washed and prepared and cooked that morning, served directly to the public for 25 cents. Um, we're very good at that. We're the most cost-efficient. We're very expert at feeding people. But at the same time, we put a strong emphasis on the idea of not only nourishing the body, but nourishing the mind and consciousness. And so that's why we, we put emphasis on how we prepare the meals and that the meals are, have a high vibration. They, they nourish the mind and soul as well. And, and talk about the educational um, and, and working with like the farmers and the people of, of the cultures to really bring about lasting change. It's one thing to give somebody some food, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible quote, feed a man for a day, you know, feed a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, but not a very good example of, of the quote <laughs> coming from a 35 year vegan. But the gist of that is, is really empower them people in empowering them to make lifestyle change and stuff you know that's what i i try to do within our company is really get people to shift away from this idea that you know there's an end goal no let's switch to doing this every day taking care of your body giving it good nutrition giving it good exercise good air that yeah. will will be a lasting effort and also changing the mindsets so how have you dealt with that on a cultural level and at a at a at the base level one on one with the people as you're um supporting them with uh, nutrition well there's a couple of ways we do that obviously in india we have our biggest projects we have projects in all the major cities and the food for life programs in india 
are partnering with the Indian government as part of the food, um, as part of the midday meal program. So it was an initiative started by the Indian government to make sure that all school children, particularly those in the poor communities, they get a, they get a freshly cooked lunch every day. Um, so we're one of the main, we are the main partner in that initiative. And just, excuse me, in India alone, our affiliates serve over 1.3 million meals every single day, vegan meals every day. So in total, our, our network of affiliates do over 2 million meals every day, freshly cooked meals. Um, so that what's interesting about that project in India is that it's working directly with the schools. And what happens is it motivates the parents to send their kids to school, kids which normally would be engaged in labor, child labor, because their parents are very poor and they need their kids to help support them. Right. So rather than do that, they say, you know what? go to school because you're going to get a free lunch. And so you, you can imagine the greater impact of that. These kids actually get an education and they can gradually get out of poverty. Um, so we, there's one example. And then other than that, we have a lot of programs where we are teaching them how to grow their own food. We have vegan education programs. And then just the food yoga program alone, that's a new initiative. The idea, the idea here is that we're trying to teach people about the power of food to unite the world. And we believe that hunger is not because of lack of food. Mm. Hunger is because of inequality, because there's plenty of food in the world. The earth has enough capacity to feed maybe three times the population. And the World Food Program is aware of this. And they basically, they've come to the conclusion that the cause of hunger is an equitable distribution. Yes. But no one is asking the next question, why is there inequitable distribution? Mm -hmm. What's the reason behind that? No one wants to ask that question, but we do. And we believe the answer is when we promote equality, that all beings are a spiritual family. We're all earthlings. Even if you're not, a, you're not a spiritual person, at the end of the day, we're all earthlings. And we should make sure that our brothers and sisters are fed. Some, some very basic foundational things. You know, I... Uh... For me, my spiritual awakening was at a point where I came to a crux point. I was um, suicidally depressed and dealing with depression, lost my mother, lost my father, lost my brother, all within a short, very, very short period of time and went into a very dark space. And when I had someone help me and release that pain through therapy, it was such a revelation for me. I felt so grateful to being released from my own pain. My first inclination was, how do I pay this forward? Mm -hmm. How do I help release pain? That's when the awareness, that aha moment came to me, just start stop harming animals. And I became vegan that day. It was that clear and obvious to me. But I committed the rest of my life to saying, how, how can I help others reduce their amount of suffering in the world you know and so i i love hearing what you're doing and i love being a partner with you in carrying out your mission to release some of that suffering and some of the suffering for many people around the world you're in what over 60 countries now yeah we're in actually 60 we have over 200 affiliates 200 wow. projects in 60 countries so, I mean, the reach of that is just phenomenal. And that's why I love being a part of this, because it, within our, you know, sphere of reach, we are going to give uh, two meals for every purchase of our, our plant protein. So that's a way that people can participate in what you're doing and, and still doing something for themselves, too, as well. Yeah. It's just a beautiful way to tie this all together, you know. <laughs> And, and, and for me, it's like, okay, you have to, I, I needed a, some way to support myself and make a living. But if I could do this in a way that also supported my, my soul's journey, which is wanting to give yeah. back and create less suffering in this world. Um, I, I feel like I've come full circle. You know, I, I feel like I've been finally, you know, I've, I've presented a brand that is generating enough revenue that I'm able to reach and, and and offer this opportunity to continue to give back in more creative ways that I couldn't before. I, I, I like you, uh, 
I spent four years on the road. I took a vow of poverty and wouldn't even wow. touch money for two years. Um, so uh, a vow of abstinence as well. So I, I, I share that part of the journey with you. I traveled to over 48 countries all around with no money, which wow. was an incredible feat. You know what it's like. I've been to, I, several, I've been to <laughs> several countries. And as a monk, as a monk, I probably visited at least 45 countries. And I never had a bank account. I never had a credit card, no, no health insurance. <laughs> And some people think, oh, that's impossible. That's not true. <laughs> like, it, it, it is possible. And, you know, I, I uh, used to be, well, how did you do that? How did you get meals? And I said, well, I, I counted on the goodness of people. Yeah. And they said, oh, you're freeloading. And I said, no. Isn't it a beautiful gift when someone presents you with the opportunity to help yeah. them? Yeah. And I said, that's a gift you can give someone by being in need and, and allowing them to help you. We all won't feel good about helping somebody else in need, but we yeah. need to be presented with that opportunity. That's why I love what you're doing with Food for Life. But you've also created another part of Food for Life, which is the Feed Om. Um, I know uh, there are a lot of um, nonprofits out there, but people wonder or question, okay, Where's my money really going to? And are these companies really giving back? And right. I think you found a beautiful way of giving people a confidence to believe in what we're doing, to see it firsthand. Talk about the Feed Om and how that came about and how it works. So the funny thing about Feed Om is that the initial idea was conceived around 27 years ago when I was a monk. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Way back in Australia, I had this idea. I was running a food flow project from the farm, and I thought, wow, how can I raise funds for this project? Maybe I can develop a snack bar and sell a snack bar and make profits. Then I came up with this idea of a mini snack bar, right? And we would call it the Food for Life Bite. It's still a great idea, by the way. <laughs> uh, food for Life Bite would be a miniature snack bar that would sell at the checkout counter, and we would sell it for a dollar. And the profit that we made, we would feed a child. So the, the tagline was, take a bite and feed a child. That's oh, beautiful, right? Beautiful. So I approached, so that, that project got put on hold when I left Australia. So it was before I, before I left, left Australia. And then a few years later, I realized, well, I'm, I should really try and follow this up. So I approached a few vegan snack food companies and presented the idea, and they all liked it. But they always said, okay, we'll do that, but you have to pay for the new packaging or whatever. Mm. For various reasons, it never got off the ground. And then about three or four years ago, I had an epiphany. I realized, you know what? It's not the snack bar that's the, that's the product. It's the actual guarantee of feeding a child. Mm. That's the product. Mm. And if we, if we market that product, we can apply this guarantee across the board, all types of conscious products and services so we i came up with the idea of the om guarantee and as we all know om is a spiritual sound vibration it represents yes. the name of god but in this case it's an acronym that stands for output measurable guarantee mm -hmm. so it's an output a measurable output uh, a guarantee of a measurable social output mm -hmm. so we provide a guarantee to conscious companies like yours that if you give us 25 cents we will guarantee that a child, a needy child, will, will be provided a freshly cooked vegan meal. And so awesome. we, we realized that in order to do this most effectively, we had to set up a separate social enterprise. You can hear the rooster in the background. That's, <laughs> That's the yeah. animal sanctuary, your wife's animal sanctuary, right? Well, I'm, I'm on it. Yeah, it's animal sanctuary in the Andes Mountains of Colombia. We're actually right. two miles above sea level. Um, so the certification is a way for companies like yours to do good, to mm. do cause marketing, but get a digital asset which can add real value to your branding and make you stand out. So in your case, you have decided, okay, we're going to feed two kids with the sale of this protein product. Um, essentially, that's a 50, do, a 50, 50 cent investment, mm. but two vegan meals, it's, it's amazing value. And you get a certification which can add, it's a real value add on to your branding. And not only that, we've recently introduced blockchain. So all the transaction, transactions are captured in the blockchain. So it's absolutely transparent. When you pay 25 cents for these 
guarantees it's captured in the blockchain we then deliver that money to the charity charity partners that we have to deliver those outputs that, that that's just that's just wonderful i mean what a what an amazing some of the best ideas come in 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 meditation right i know <laughs> that's where i found the uh, veganism is through meditation i was meditating and it came to me but it's it's another thing to put some of those ideas in action and to make them come to fruition so thank you for for doing that work that leg work and making life's work out of it um and yes i uh, you can go to our website it's on our banner right now you click on the banner it'll take you to the page and you can see the qr code you can use that qr code if you're from your phone or click right through uh, to the Food for Life Global website, and you can see it. I've also um, got our partner page. You can see it up here on the screen right now. We're partners, or you can go directly to Food for Life Global at their website. Um, you can also donate directly from the website. They have a link right there where you can donate directly. Or remember, your 10% uh, of all of our sales for the month of December 2020, if you're watching this sometime in the future, 10% of all of our sales are going to Food for Life Global. On top of that, for the rest of the time that at least I own the company, <laughs> uh, all of our clean green protein sales uh, will feed two children for every single tub. So every time you buy a tub of clean green protein, you will actually be feeding two children around the world through Food for Life Global. So thank you for that. And if you want to follow um, uh, Food for Life on Facebook, see what they're up to, the different projects that they're working on. I was reading through the pages. It's amazing stuff that, uh, that the group is doing. And um, thank you for all of that. Through, through all of this, I know you've had some amazing life experiences. I, there's nothing like being one-on-one. -on -one. I worked in um, Jamaica for a nonprofit. We were giving out um, clothing, shoes, and bicycles to children because just like the food, they can't attend schools without shoes. So many of the kids were staying entrenched in poverty because they had no shoes. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a little strange that Jamaica actually didn't allow uh, outside foreigners to do this. So we actually had to smuggle shoes and clothing and bicycles in <laughs> and yeah. to give them away to the children. So, but it was a beautiful project. I enjoyed working on it and just seeing the face light up on these children, seeing the moms so happy that their kid was going to get to go to school and the chance, a better chance to lift them out of poverty. It's just an amazing experience. Talk mm -hmm. to me about that personal experience that you have. For me, I mean, it it brings tears to my eyes just rethinking about that. The the intense yeah, joy amazing. and connection is is amazing. It is. There's nothing like in the field now. As the executive director, obviously, I'm doing a lot of work from the office here, um, but I have been in the field on various uh, during various emergency re relief efforts um one in particular was a, the great tsunami of 2004 boxing day remember that big tsunami mm -hmm. it killed 250,000 people actually so i actually uh organized 50 volunteers from around the world to converge on the island of sri lanka which was heavily hit three quarters of the island sri lanka is shaped like a teardrop literally three quarters of the island was the coastline was devastated Wow. I can't remember the number of people killed, but it was a lot. A lot of people displaced. So I was there for three months responding to that. We set up kitchens in the villages. We were cooking on firewood. We were engaging the local people and actually helping us prepare the meals so that, you know, the, the mothers would be cutting their vegetables and the kids would be helping. We gave them all T-shirts. Mm -hmm. And um, it was an amazing experience. You know, they, they felt loved. They felt like, okay, we're, we, we have some hope here. Oh. A lot of these, and they, as I said, they lost everything. All of their houses were just devastated. And we came across many people just looking for remnants of their life. And one one particular moment, I was walking on a beach and I noticed a photo of a, of a woman. And I picked it up and I walked another 100 meters and I found a group of men. And I mm -hmm. said, do you know who this is? And, and one of them 
just started crying and he realized that was a picture of his wife who had been taken away by the ocean. Oh, wow. Yeah, just by coincidence, I happened to find the picture and I handed it to him and he was like so, so appreciative that I found a picture of his wife. So it was, you know, I was there for three months and we did what we could. Uh, we even worked with a local orphanage because there were a lot of orphans that came from that tsunami and we supported them. Um, and we did a lot of therapy for the kids. We did art therapy. And as I said, we brought 50 volunteers from around the world. And then there's Hurricane Katrina and the earthquake in Haiti and um, the earthquake in Mexico. We've responded to some of the biggest biggest natural disasters in the world. We're, we're typically always first responders. We're there on the ground providing freshly cooked vegan meals. And it's um, and I've been to a lot of them, not all of them. And uh, it's it's touching. And you realize, wow. I'm doing something meaningful. I can I can die tomorrow knowing that my life, you know, I've actually contributed something positive to the world. But none of that happens without, you know, the donations and the funding and exactly. the organization. So that's why, you know, even, you know, sometimes I I I miss being in one-on-one -on -one contact with people and that direct experience. But I know at this level, I can give it a, even a different level. And all of it's important, um, whether yeah. you're organizing or whether you're on the streets actually handing out the food directly to people. It's all important. And that's what it makes it for a yeah, and, and in terms of like you ask that question, a lot of people do ask that question, where does the money go to? You know, how much money mm -hmm. goes to operations? So up until recently, I was actually a volunteer. Uh, for Food for Life. I'm the director of the organization. I now pay myself um, about, what is it, 50, uh, $20 a day. <laughs> no, not even that. I think $12.50 a day. $12.50. <laughs> so you should, for your work. <laughs> you should not worry that the money is going to big fat bank, uh, you know, or wages. And, right. Yeah, we, we, we used all the money in, in programs, other educational food relief. And, and that's what, you know, humans are capable of. So uh, thank you for, for being a light in that way. And thank you for being an example for others to follow. I know uh, in, in a very different way, being an entrepreneur, uh, I didn't take a salary for the first five years almost of the company. Um, all of it went back into finding new uh, plants to bring to market. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, when you do something that you're passionate about, when th that brings you a level of joy and uh, commit uh, um, reward, that deep soulful reward of what you feel you're giving back to society, it's, it's a beautiful experience. Um, so, in your in this whole journey from 14 years as a monk to running an amazing and growing a, uh, a, an amazing nonprofit and all the groups and all the people you've worked with, give me a, a couple of words of wisdom, some some gems and tidbits that you've picked up in your life that are are meaningful. Well, obviously, the experience of being a monk has impacted me tremendously. At a very deep personal level, um, because during that 14 years, I was very sincere, practiced very seriously um, being a celibate monk. Um, I spent all of my waking hours trying to develop and raise my consciousness and be pure and clean in thought and pure in, act, in, in behavior and so on. So as a result of that, it's even though I've I've entered into the corporate world, I used, I was a um, ten year vet at the World Bank. I was actually a consultant at the World Bank. That's another interesting story. I trained myself how to develop websites as a monk, mm -hmm. and then after I got married in 1997, uh, I started building websites, started a web development business, and then in 2000 the World Bank hired me. <laughs> I'd never had a real job before that. So that was the first real job. And I was at the World Bank. You know, I was a senior executive at the World Bank for 10 years, consulting. I built most of their major websites during that period. Um, so words of wisdom, the biggest takeaway, and that's it, the Food Yoga book is, you know, a life of meditation. 
Um, in food yoga, I talk about the importance of food in not only nourishing our body and respecting our body as a temple, because it is a blessing to, to have a human form. According to the ancient Vedas, there are 8.4 million species of life. According to modern science, they calculate it at 8.7 million. So it's very, very close. Even though the Vedas were written 5,000 years ago, mm -hmm. we're actually pretty close to modern estimates. So we could have so many different bodies, so many different physical forms, but right now we have a, a human form, and it's a real blessing because it's only in the human form that we have the ability to inquire about the meaning of life, mm -hmm. to actually raise our consciousness, to prepare ourselves for the time of death, and to take that wisdom with us because that's the only thing you can take with you. You can't take your wealth, you can't take your fame, you can't take your possessions. You can only take your wisdom, your consciousness. So what we learned as monks was to always prepare for that final day, because it may be tomorrow, to actually prepare yourself, to always be ready so that you know what you need to do at the time of death. And the most important lesson that I learned as a monk, and I've practiced throughout my life, is that evolution of consciousness begins when we master the tongue. So as a monk, you can imagine at the age of 19, practicing celibacy is no joke. It's pretty mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. So I did that from you know the prime years of a man's life, 19 to 33. The only way I was able to do that was I learned how to master the tongue. The tongue has two functions, tasting and vibrating. So everything I ate was always pure and offered with devotion to, to God. It was a very high vibration food. And everything I spoke was always truthful, uplifting, and and you know, and, and nourishing to people. Mm -hmm. So if you master the tongue, that enables you to master all the other senses in the body, including the mind. And that's the most important thing, lesson I can pass on to people. So I'm sure that there's lots of more words of wisdom in your book. How could people who would like to read more about uh, your work with the uh, um, with the food yoga, um, myself included, I'm fascinated by that. <laughs> uh, how could they do that? Is it available on Amazon? It is on Amazon. It's actually five star rated on Amazon. It's gotten good reviews. And so you can find it on, on Amazon food yoga. And you'll find there's a few other books that I've written as well. The most recent book I wrote was called, is called The Seven Maxims of Soul. Oh, where is it? Upside down. <laughs> the Seven Maxims of Soul Happiness. Awesome. That's my latest book. So in that book, I share ideas of how you can always stay in a happy state of mind. Well, isn't that the challenge, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just really want to deeply thank you. You're born in 63. So was I. You you set out on a, a spiritual journey you were first questioning through science yours was astronomy mine was biology but uh jacques cousteau was my hero as he was uh you know disclosing the wonders of sea life and the world be below us so I, I share so much in common with you i feel a kindred spirit and and love the path that you've taken i'm so grateful to partner with you with Food for Life Global, to be able to feed children as well um, and providing nutrition. So, you know, when I found lentin as a plant that were higher in nutrition and higher in protein uh, than any other plant in the world, I was so pleased to be able to provide that for people. And now that I know that in that, it will also provide nutrition, basic nutrition, fundamental nutrition, <laughs> life-saving nutrition, to two children as well. Uh, makes me feel great. So thank you again for all you do. It's a pleasure to have you on. Maybe we'll have you back and talk again sometime. Sure. Uh, and um, I really thank you for coming on and sharing um, your life's work with us. Are you most welcome? And if if your listeners who run companies would would like to learn more about the Om Guarantee certification, they can go to omguarantee.com. Right. So uh, you can partner with uh, Food for Life Global, both as an individual or as a partner. If you have a plant based uh, uh, company and would like to also participate, you know, <laughs> let's all let's all join in and make this 
you know, if we can give just a little bit, as he said, 25 cents to feed a child, it is so little, uh, such a small part of what we do as business people, giving some of that towards and paying it forward, beautiful gift for, for everyone. Thank you. I, th I appreciate the opportunity to share this with your listeners. Thank you. Well, join us next week for a new uh, Facebook Live. Uh, where we're going to be talking with some special guests that I think you're really going to enjoy in the health and fitness field. Thanks again, Paul. And Thank you very much, Jeff. God bless you. Blessings to you as well.